Good afternoon. We're ready for our next session. I'm Marianne Canada from HGTV Handmade and member of the Mayor's Maker Council. I'm delighted to introduce my friend, Chris McAdoo, who's here to discuss the role of pivots in our lives and how to take advantage of them. Welcome, Chris. Hello. Did that work? Am I here? I'm over here paying attention to everybody on the Q&A uh, and the, uh, everything. So as we as we go on, uh, please drop me some questions uh, as you come up with them. Hey, everybody. I'm Chris McAdoo. Um, thank you for sticking out, man. It's been a day, right? Uh, a lot of tactical stuff, a lot of strategic stuff, and a lot of inspiration from a, just a lot of inspiring uh, inspiring people. So uh, I want to say thanks, too, to Marianne Canada, uh, one of the creative queens of this town, and she's just an absolute force of nature. So I appreciate that intro. And I want to say thanks to the Maker City um, and everybody here, meaning like virtually here uh, and all around. Like we should be thankful that we have an organization like this. And these guys are willing to put on an event that, uh, well, virtual, it's a little bit different, but I think it's going to be pretty cool all the same. So thank you for tuning in. You've already made a commitment to make things better for yourself, for your art, and for our community. See, I've lived a life, and I've been super lucky to be surrounded and filled with creativity. All right? I've been a painter. I've been a print. Well, I am a painter. I guess I'm in my studio, right? So there's a mess. Always uh, check colors on the wall. Um, I make messes and I tell stories, but I've been a painter, a printmaker, a business owner, a designer, a director, many things. Um, and I grew up around creativity. Uh, I've had a lot of opportunity and I've taken a lot of opportunity over the last 20 years or so. Um, and then we're going to talk about pivots, right? The art of the pivot. I've also gotten a little bit lost, like most of us, you know, like, okay, so everybody out there, raise your digital hand if you're a creative person that can be all the way up in the sky in Rainbow Town and you are the unicorn that the rainbow is, is, is flying along and everything is going well. And then boom, like that, you can be crashing. You can be crashing down. Um, I mean, that's me. I don't know. You know, um, we've got, a, oh, there's a lot, of, a lot of folks. Okay, here we go. Um, those voices inside your head that are going to tell you that you are not good enough. You are not creative enough. You are not smart enough. You are not enough. We all hear those little voices, right? Sometimes we need to remind ourselves or be reminded as the case may be that we are enough, that you are enough. Um, and it may not be easy, but that's where the hard work comes in. And we've got the tools and a community like this at our disposal to help lift ourselves up um, in those big and small moments, those big pivot moments. So I've got a big idea for everyone. And by the way, speaking of pivots, um, I'm used to rooms full of people. And I'm used to not taking notes. And I'm used to just like my notes for a presentation would be like, don't cuss so much or uh, talk about color red or something like that. So this is a pivot for me that I hope that you guys in, enjoy, but I'm going from kind of detailed notes uh, and it's kind of, it's fun to do something like this. So I've got a big idea for everybody. And I think we are all responsible for living out our values. Okay. And I'm talking creatively. I'm talking personally. I'm talking professionally, all the things. And we're presented with these big opportunities, these big pivot moments. It's our opportunities to put those values into action. All right. So we got to take them or we got to figure out how to make them ourselves, how to make those pivots happen, how to make and harness those big pivot moments for ourselves. Now, a big pivot moment, a pivot in our lives can be a birth, a death, a move, a new relationship, um, a, a, a new start, an illness. I mean, right now, every single one of us are in the middle of the biggest pivot of our lives, of our parents' lives, of our grandparents' lives, of our kids' lives. And we've been in the middle of it for months. And you can see how the folks at the Maker City and so many other folks have made that 
pivot, to engage and to matter to the folks that matter to them. And that is a huge challenge. Yesterday was 9-11. You want to talk about a pivot? Everybody remembers where they were. I was nursing or I was feeding a then son who is now a sophomore in college when that happens. So sometimes those pivot moments can come right down. They're right there. And you can put yourself in that place. Okay. So I want you to put yourself in that place. I want you to take a moment. Uh, everybody that's kind of watching, I didn't do worksheets. I, I, it's fine. But you guys can, can, can write down yourself or just make a note. And then we can kind of go back in the Q&A later to talk through some of these. I want you to take a, a, a minute and I want a, you to think about your biggest big pivot moment. And I want you to write it down. OK, I want you to take a pivot moment. Was it a, a big move? Was it a creative art piece? Was it like you finally made that thing? OK, I want you to write it down and I want you to think about what happened. How did you react to it? What happened uh, in the immediate aftermath? How did that a moment affect you in the short term as well as the long term? Like, what are those things? What are, Like every single one of us, we're all like the high school weirdos, right? Like, I know I am. It was the art kid whose art teacher, his junior year of high school, said, if you keep drawing like this, you will never make something of yourself. Boom, it puts me right back, right? It's like 1995, Jefferson County. Um, and we've all got those moments. And I want you to think about those positively or negatively, how they have affected you as, not just as a maker, but as a, like as a human, right? So we're going to talk about those values, um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about mine. I'm going to tell you a little story um, here in a minute. But a big thing about putting values and putting your particular strengths into action is, um, is I think it's a Mike. T I think Mike Tyson, the boxer, said basically everything makes sense until you get punched in the face. It's a terrible paraphrase, but it works, right? And it's and it's and it's like going into battle and everything works on paper, but then you actually have to make it work. Okay, and so life doesn't move by plan. Life doesn't move in a straight line and especially a creative life. So we're going to talk about these values and we're going to talk about three things. We're going to talk about defining, refining, and activating those values. So let's number one, I'm going to define a big value for me, right? Sometimes these big pivot moments lead us to those values. And I'm going to tell you a story in just a second about how I came to this value. And my big value is independence above all. I crave it. I love it for myself. And I want to motivate others to seek it as well. Independence. Now, I want to refine that value. I've defined it. Now I'm going to refine it. Why does it? Why? What does it mean to me? And why does it matter? Like for me, like maybe I'm just kind of a baby. Maybe I just don't like to be told what to do, which is entirely possible. Maybe I just really don't like a regular job. I've only had one. Um, or maybe I just like being on my own schedule, on my own terms. You know, independence to me, like we've all seen Hamilton. Um, if you haven't, just go see it. Just give up. Just go, just go watch it on Disney Plus or find a friend with Disney Plus. It's fine. But if you go, Hamilton, they fight for independence. Independence for me is the thing that I am willing to steal the horses and burn the boats to make happen. It is worth fighting for. Okay. Uh, and I mean, that's pretty dramatic, but also maybe I'm just an only child and it kind of shows. So. It, either way, we have defined, we have refined. So what is it? Why is it? And then number three is activate. Okay. What kind of behavior will allow you to live that value, right? Because everything that we talk about, it's all talk until we make it happen, until we put a plan together or until we take that first step backwards into the dark. It's all just words. So what are the steps that we can take to positively affect your life, your career, to affect those around you? What step can you take today, right, today to bring your values to life? For me, 
Uh, I've made a lot of life choices in the last even two months that allow me to bring that independence to bear for the better, hopefully. And today, I hopefully will help encourage that in you guys as well. So I'm going to ask you again, like there's a lot of these little questions that we don't like you can just think about these and I hope it gives you a lot to think about. But what is your value? How does it you and what are the steps that you could take today to put that value into action? Maybe it's tactical. Maybe it's literally like making talking to somebody like Adrian Webster and making sure your LLC is set up correctly or, or negotiating rent on a space or getting that laser gun you've always wanted. If you do get a laser gun, I feel like that I'm not going to say get a laser gun. I don't know what you would be doing with that. It seems unsafe, but maybe it's strategic. If you want to write that book, if you want to make that piece of art, if you want to be a jeweler, if you want to create, does it mean that tomorrow you get up an hour early before everybody else does to make sure that you make that happen? Does it mean that you stay up an hour later? Does it mean that you don't rewatch all of Battlestar Galactica on Netflix because you've already seen it twice? That's enough. It's fine. They're still there. Um, the only way to run faster sometimes is to run faster. I said that. I think it's a decently quotable quote, but we'll work on it. It's fine. But sometimes you just have to put that one foot in front of the other to activate those values. So I'm going to tell you my story. Things are going to get heavy for a second, but don't worry. <laughs> don't worry. Stick with me. I'm going to call this story ready to meet Jesus, but maybe later. All right. Um, it's, a, it's a big thing that led me to think about these big pivot moments. And it's why I'm talking about it with you now. You see, on June 24th, I was walking my dog in the morning around eight o'clock, as I do every morning. The dog is wonderful. Dumb as a bag of hammers. Just a great dog. That is not important to the story. I found out uh, quite by accident that I am deathly allergic to yellow jackets. So I get stung several times around eight o'clock. By 8.05, I'm home. By 8.10-ish, ish, I go into full anaphylactic shock. I had no idea. And for those of you with allergies, with your own or with family or with kids, like you get it. You know what can happen, and I didn't. It was terrifying. And it was, I would find out later, my wife called 911. If we had gotten in the car to make it to the hospital, I would not be talking with you today. I had minutes. Okay. So the fire department gets there first. Um, I'm in and out of consciousness, blacking out, just a pool on the kitchen floor. My daughter's there. My son, like everybody's there. And it's like, okay, the fire department gets there first. And the last, maybe the first thing you want to see is like fire department guys, like big beefy fire department guys. And one of the, uh, one of the, in, in my consciousness, I look up and I see one of the firefighter guys go, Oh shit. And he runs over and grabs, you know, he's got the bag and the EpiPen comes out. Um, so an EpiPen, an ambulance ride with another, uh, with another EpiPen and a hospital visit later where my uh, blood pressure at one point got down to like 70 over 40. And it was another nurse. It was another nurse moving very quickly. A nurse saying, oh, shit. Um, so so it was a it was a day. It was a morning of almost not being on the other side of it. Now, I'm going to ask you, um, so as I was being like hauled off on the stretcher and going to the ambulance uh, for, 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 we didn't know, what did I yell to my wife? What did I say? Ah, what did I, did I, did I sell a, did I, did I put together a poem for the ages or a love letter or a, 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 a I'll love you forever? So look, we know I did not. I did not uh, uh, give Titanic level romance. I asked her to bring my computer to the hospital. And that does not reflect well on me. You see, I had a client presentation that afternoon and I didn't know when I'd be back, right? Like, who does that? Um, also, my wife did not bring that computer to the hospital. So for the record. Um, so as a creative director, 
for a major advertising agency, like life moves fast and there's a lot of pressure. Some you put yourself, you put yourself into that afternoon. I'm home by 1230. I'm on a call by one. I'm on a zoom by two and by three o'clock, I am leading a client presentation for about 20, 25 people. And I'm super high on steroids. Like I've got Benadryl, I've got epinephrine, I've got all, I, I don't even know. But when I was done with that day, I realized that something had to change. And I realized that I was the only one that could do anything about that. And I set the wheels in motion. And about a month later, I left my position as creative director at one of the South's like best agencies, Design Sensory here in town. Wonderful, wonderful people. Um, but it was time. Um, I'd always made art as a painter. And now I had made my own pivot. And here we are. I had to make a decision that it was it, it was the decision for me to make. And I'm wondering if out there you guys are thinking through some of those same those same things. You see, I wish I gained all this insight from like reading a good book or seeing a beautiful sunset, but I needed a smack upside the head or a shock to the central nervous system as the case may be. You see, um, my ambition had coupled with my anxieties and created this delightfully terrible little cocktail. See, I'd sold my company, Best Behavior Creative Club, about two years prior, and I'd felt not quite at home um, for some time, even though I loved the people and the, and the work, I just didn't know what to do about it. And I felt powerless, anxiety ridden, and just generally shitty to be around. Um, I'd put limitations on myself for the first time in my life, and I didn't know what to do about it. And I, I was having panic attacks straight up, like boom. Um, so what are some of those? Again, I'm going to give you guys opportunities to think about there's other little notes that you can you can make is, is like limitations. Um, what are some of those limitations that you put on yourself, either real or unreal? Um, and I, I had been putting those on my myself and I'd never done that before. Right. So. Here we are today and I'm and I'm talking about now I'm going to start talking about that little voice in the back of your head, because like I said, I hadn't feel felt quite right for some time. and. I want to get to that little voice in the back of your head that's telling you something. And a lot of times it's right. If you're uncomfortable, if you are in need of a change, if you need to make that pivot moment happen for yourself, you see, for me, there's a difference between being an amateur and a professional and a professional works every day. They're consistent. I believe earlier Austin Church gave uh, in his marketing presentation, he even said that consistency is going to be everything else. And that is the same in life. And I had allowed myself to be inconsistent. I'd allowed myself to be mean to myself. I had allowed myself to think less of the work that I was doing and the work that I was capable of doing. And that is not correct. So practice, practice practice and I needed that time, what are the things that only you can do that you can improve and invite the world to take part in your own like little adventure? I want you to look up. Here's another artist to look up. His name's Chuck Close. In the mid 70s, you may know the name in the mid 70s, right before his biggest art exhibition of his career, he had a stroke and lost uh, movement to 90 percent of his body. And he wouldn't create the work that we all see in history textbooks until after that. So you want to talk about a pivot. You want to talk about somebody that had defined their value. They had defined their what matters to them and what matters to the people around them in a big way. And that's Chuck Close. It's wise to remember to me, too, that we take ourselves seriously. When we say yes to something, say yes. Don't go halfway. Say yes. Because when you say yes to something, yes, I'm going to do this. Yes, I'm going to accept this opportunity. Yes, I'm going to participate in this. You're saying no to something else. All right. And so make sure that it's worth it. Make sure that it aligns with that value that you have defined, refined, and learned how to activate. 
make sure that that meeting, that gallery open, that one extra hour, that means more than the birthday party, the soccer games, and the Christmas plays. Sometimes the answer is yes. Um, for me, again, like my big value is independence, right? So I want to decide. I don't like being told. And I want to provide, <laughs> and I want to be there for people in the best way. And so that independence allows me to do that. So we've talked a lot about, um, we've talked a lot about value and we've talked a lot about focus, like figuring out what that means and why. And I'm also going to talk about time and space, not in the Neil deGrasse Tyson way, but creating space and making time, being deliberate about the things that you do, demanding time and demanding space. Because if we don't take it, if you don't take that space to learn, to improve, to work on those values, it's not going to be handed, handed to you. So this is what photographer and entrepreneur Charles Chase Jarvis calls the five to nine, which I like. It's like taking that hit. If you have to take that, uh, you know, stay up one hour late, if you have to get up one hour early, that is a thing that is very doable. That is so doable. If you want to stay up late to write, paint, create, start that business you've always dreamed of. You see, this is a really interesting time, too, because we have been presented with time. Since this pandemic started, we've all gotten time back. And we have this incredible power to use that time to better ourselves, to better those around us, to better our craft. And it's up to us to use that time to the best. Time's the only thing that's equal for everybody. So we're all running this same race with the same finish line. And again, I'm kind of coming back to that journey between life moves like this. Okay. And I'd also say we're taking that time, use it wisely, learn to master your craft. And it's also like, it kind of gives you a responsibility. Like don't talk about making music, make music music. Don't talk about making art, make art. Don't talk about writing, write, start it, start small and start poorly if you need to. <laughs> That's perfectly fine. I think we're all in this weird internet age where we feel like everything has to be a finished product and that is not, that is not the case. And when you talk about finished products, I'm also going to talk to you about uh, a big value uh, that we can all um, give to ourselves and to others. And that value is grace. That's that time. That's that understanding. That's that space to say, you know what? That's a pretty stressful time. This is kind of crazy out here. Like maybe that person needs a little bit extra. Maybe, you know, it's kind of one of those, um, like if you're thinking about a friend, if you're thinking about a fellow creator, a family, anything like that, and you're thinking, I wonder how they're doing now is the time to reach out because I think that that is a value in itself, right? Like, how are you doing? I think too often we kind of go within ourselves and that's where those limitations come from. That's where that fear comes from. That's where we set up our own walls. And so now is the time to take the time to tear those walls down. I am currently operating at what I like to call sabbatical style peak inefficiency. All right. I'm not managing my burn rate. I am not uh, watching my margins. I'm not doing those things. I will again, but right now I'm creating that time and sharing it with you guys um, to hopefully do the same. So a maker's career doesn't move in a straight line in the first place. Projects never go as planned. Understand that and like put that in your pocket. Projects never go as planned and that's okay. You see, it's the pivots, it's the twists and the turns, the walls to climb the people we help up and the people that help us over. That's what reveals who we are. That's what reveals those values. Define, refine, and activate. You've got to hold tight and you've got to hold fast to the things that value, that you value. All right?
It's the pivots. It's the pivots that make us who we are. It makes us the artists, the makers, the mothers, the fathers, the sisters, the brothers, the dads, the moms, the people, and the leaders. I'm looking at you. I'm looking directly at you. You see, there's a lot of room at this table. There's a room at the table of creativity, of business, of community, of family, of life, of, 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 of values, all of these things. There's a lot of room at that table. And I want to tell you, every single one of us has an invitation to that table, but it's up to us to use it. We've only got so much time. And as my big pivot moment ta taught me, you use the time that you have the best way that you can. All right? So we've all got that invitation, and it's up to you to accept it. Thank you. That's the thing. That was the thing I was going to say. We can open it up to, to Q&A. I think, yeah, here we go. Alex, what you got for me? Oh, here's, okay, wait, I'm looking over at the chat, too. <laughs> Sucking at something is the first step to becoming sort of good at something. Alex, you, you, you are wise. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, good grief. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, yeah, Sis, I don't know if it's time to get the late. I don't know if they sell laser gun. Like, I feel like laser guns were probably something uh, that went in high demand, like bicycles, you know, like during the pandemic. Um, <laughs> oh, man. Oh, wow. Oh, thank you so much, guys. Th good grief. Yes, thank you. Um, oh, okay. Okay. So um, Lisa, she's asked, where do you find your best inspiration for each project? So I think that's a great, um, that is a great question. So uh, sometimes I find my best inspiration, um, like I'm always looking, you know, so it kind of depends on what kind of project that I'm, I'm starting. Cause I'll tend to, if it's, if it's a painting, um, if it's a painting project, uh, I have, I've been at this for a long time. And so I've kind of got a lot of inspiration there. And I find that, um, how do I say this? Like inspiration happens a whole lot more when you are working. So if you put in hours every day or you put in time every day, there's a whole lot more opportunity for inspiration. Um, but at least honestly, I find inspiration in other people more than anything. I love to see people making. I love to see people creating and pushing themselves. And it makes me kind of want to do that too. Cause you see somebody over here and they're like, Oh shit, that's really good. Like, um, so I, it's sort of a, a you know, an, an answer to that. Um, but that, I hope that answers, I hope that answers your, your question. Um, uh, let's see. Hold on. Let me see. What, what order are we going in here? What are you working on? Okay. Well, actually that is my studio wall. Um, so I'll typically set up large paintings, which you guys, um, just, oh, uh, my website is chrismcadoo.com, M-C-A-D-O-O.com. Um, I am going to start an email newsletter, so please, uh, go there, sign up. I'll, I'll probably once a month, again, I'm going to start it and do it poorly at first. So grace upon me. Um, but, uh, but you can learn more and see some of the work that comes out of this uh, studio. And then I'm on Instagram as... Chris V McAdoo underscore art. So, um, but that's what, uh, that, that's what that is. Um, I've got, let's see, do you still have insecurities even though you are established? Um, oh God. Oh yes. Dorothy, Dorothy, Dorothy. Yes. I mean, I think that it, even the word established, like in comparison to what the make it, I, I did a painting a sh my show back in March was called make it real compared to what I could say, make it established compared to what, um, I think as creators, uh, you always have that insecurity. And like, I am, uh, I don't know if I, if I, if I'm ADHD, but probably, uh, I did start actually, Hey, here's some good stuff. After that, I did start seeing a therapist, a shrink, 
that has helped me a lot to deal with those insecurities. Um, but yes, absolutely. Both as a creator, as a professional, as a dad, as a, as an everything, those insecurities, particularly for creative people, I think we can all attest never go away. And if they do, then it's, it's almost like the, inse like the insecurity sometimes is your, is your little, that, that little friend, enemy, friend of me, friend of me. It's fine. It works. But it's that, it's that piece, it's that little piece in the back of your head that makes you improve. Um, but it can also lead to obviously what I was talking about, those self limitations, those limiting feelings that can be super harmful. Um, so in answer, yes, um, I do. And I, <clears throat> And I don't feel bad about it. That's another thing uh, for all of you guys that uh, that are in that in that space and you feel like you're overburdened. You feel like you're trying to do too much or not enough or all these kind of things. Like, again, especially in the middle of a pandemic, like it's enough. You're doing the things. Um, let's see. Here we go. Uh, oh, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Uh, there's sort of different orders, but I'm going to. Um, number five. Okay. Uh, we've heard a lot of people talk about the fault of hustle culture, but at the same time, the professionalism of always working. How do you think we can best, best bridge this opposing gap? Elizabeth, that is a great question. Okay. So you can, it's, it's kind of like, um, everybody wants to fall on their sword. Like everybody, like, like every time you, you talk to anybody and it's, it's, it's that whole, like, what are you? Oh, I'm so busy. I've got so, oh, so busy. I'm so busy. Um, and that was actually a thing that had started to like, that was in my head, that hustle culture. Now here's the deal is you don't want to apologize for hustle. You don't want to apologize for being that extra, for putting in that extra time. But what you want to do is make sure that extra time is actually valuable to make sure that that hustle is actually doing something. Because I think all too often we are like uh, sort of swept up in this culture of things looking like something is successful or someone is doing something big, looking like that. And I think from the, from the hustle culture thing, like I said, I'm operating at peak inefficiency right now and loving every minute of it. Um, so I think balancing, balancing the need to create and the need to, um, to push yourself with your own personal health. Like, do you feel good? Do the people around you like to be around you? Um, and, and, and a lot of this, like, I'm, I want to get to a lot of the, the, the questions too. So I think there's, we can talk about that certainly, you know, more. And you can email me or direct message me too, just chris at chrismackadoo.com. Um, for, you know, for, uh, for further, you know, kind of a things, but you hear your Elon Musk's, you hear your Gary Vaynerchuk's, you see your Steve Jobs, like, I oh, work 27 hours a day. And how can you yada, yada, yada. And I'm rambling, but I think it's got a point. And I'm thinking about Steve Jobs and I'm thinking about how mean he was to people and these sort of horror stories that you hear about how he treated folks, um, in that ultimate hustle. And I think it's not worth it. I, we would have, somebody would have come up with something else, right? Like somebody would have figured it out. Um, so I think that there is a culture there that when folks, um, if you're leaving an office and everybody's like, oh, where are you? Oh, where are you going? Oh, you're, oh, you're leaving to go get a, a child or you're going to take care of yourself or your, all these kind of things. That's an unhealthy environment to be in. And you need to recognize that. And sometimes you need to do something about it. Um, and, and sometimes that lies with you and sometimes that lies with, you know, with an organization. I hope that sort of like at least started to answer that question. Um, the next one that, that came up was, would love to hear your thoughts on balancing personal values and actions associated with personal values with those of your coworkers, employees, family who may have different values. Ooh, Tanya, that's good. Okay, so back to that grace thing is you have to have respect for those values. And here's the thing, like you guys have all, I mean, we've all had, you, you've all had gigs. That's where culture comes into play. And sometimes it's trying to find those values that everyone can share, right? So 
while my value right now may change in six months, I don't know, but my value right now is independence. Uh, someone else's, uh, someone else's value may be the exact opposite collaboration. And if you want to work together, if you want to live together, you have to have those conversations about um, the meaning behind that refinement about why does that matter to them? Because I think so, all too often, particularly now, like in a very charged landscape, um, we hear that somebody likes the color red or someone's favorite color is red. And it's really easy in like social media town and all that kind of stuff to say like, but I like the color blue, we're sworn enemies. But that's not really the case. Like they could like red, maybe you hate red, but they like red because it reminds them of something or whatever. So I think talking to each other and being honest about the things that you are comfortable with and the things that you would like to accomplish with them um, is, is step one. And then step two is asking what's that, what's that motivation behind why they feel a certain way, why a company culture maybe is a certain way, why a community culture is a certain way. And you can understand maybe a little bit better, or we give ourselves the opportunity to be more empathetic, um, to ourselves as well as to, you know, as to others. Um, Let's see, where are we at here? Oh, there we go. Um, so I hope that that works. I hope that that answers. And again, if it didn't, please follow up with me. Um, or, or we can, and, and, I'm, and I'd love to talk with, um, love to talk with folks. Um, so the, let's see, uh, balancing personal values who have different values than you. Yeah. Now that also, uh, yeah, Thanksgiving and during a pandemic, like arguing with relatives, all bets are off. I don't know. Just stay on the porch. Um, do you have any advice on maintaining a viable work-life balance when you're running a business and have a job outside the home? Um, work-life balance, if you are going to be a creator, is going to be one of the toughest things that you're going to have to figure out um, because you have to take that time, right? You have to take that studio time. You have to take that writing time. You have to take that time. And when you take that time, it takes it away from something else. Um, so I think that that's also a matter of degrees because you can decide what success looks like as well. Because if you just enjoy doing something and you want to start something and you want to start something poorly, like don't put so much pressure on yourself to go out and be perfect. Because I think that's maybe something that got into my head as well is like I was trying to be a director. I was trying to be a painter. I was trying to be all of these different things. And I was trying to do everything at a high level, which meant when you're trying to do everything at like a level, it means everything falls to C level. Um, and, and, and so I think that as I'm talking through this, I realized that what you can do is prioritize those things that you want to do. And, you know, if you got to get the kids to soccer practice or if you've got to, whatever, like the family needs to know that, you know, Thursdays from seven to nine is your time or from Saturday mornings or whatever. Um, but finding that work-life balance and knowing also that work-life balance comes with a trade. You know, for me, I want to be home now, especially now when my daughter gets home from school and 99% of the time I am. But that means sometimes like I work super early in the morning or late at night. And those are the ch those are the choices and the trade offs that we make um, on those day to day, like tactical kind of things. Um, let's see. Oh, man. What do we got? Has uh, Gwen, since you just pivoted, what are your goals for the coming year? Gallery rep, gallery shows, a new body of work. Um, Gwen, thank you for that question. Um, I uh, yes. That's my <laughs> actually right now I'm kind of letting myself off the hook for a lot of that. I think that in the coming year, I'll do a lot of consulting. I'll do some teaching. Um, I will make a lot of art. Uh, I will make I, I just uh, I'm represented here in town by, by a place called Bennett Galleries. And then I'm represented in South Carolina um, by a gallery called Art and Light. Um, and then I also. Um, just I ship 
a lot of things to just direct collectors and stuff all over the United States. And I've been very fortunate to have developed a collector base. Um, so one of the things that I do plan on doing, like I said, I'm going to do that email newsletter is re-engaging with everybody. Cause I kind of let that slide for a couple of years. Um, and I'm going to re-engage. So that is a very strategic goal of mine is like figuring out what that artistic voice looks like for the next 20 years or at least for the next year in re-engaging with that audience that has already said they find value in the things that I'm doing. Um, but otherwise just taking the time right now, uh, operating at peak inefficiently, at least through Christmas time. Um, let's see. Uh, has there ever been a time where you felt an impending pivot <laughs> as, as, uh, as a human that is, uh, filled to the brim with anxiety? There's always an impending pivot. I think that, um, I think that I've felt even, okay. Even before super death yellow jacket attack, like I felt like something needed to happen. Right. Like I, I knew I needed to change, but I didn't know what that was. The, you know, yellow jacket fight definitely put that in perspective. Um, you feel it. There's a, there's a feeling back here, like at the, you know, at the nape of your neck that you just know that something is, uh, that something is about to happen or something needs to happen. It's your choice whether or not to act on it for sure. And then, um, Let's see, uh, what sets you apart to allow your pivots to move forward? Okay, this is actually, this is a good one. Um, okay, so the thing that this pivot has allowed me to do, thank you, therapist, um, has allowed me to separate things that happen to me from things that I am. Meaning, like we talk a lot about um, how you define yourself, right? Like this situation is hard, uh, so I am a failure or the, or I, I am not good enough. I am not enough. All those kind of things where in actuality, this situation is hard and I am dealing with it is the way to do that. So that sort of pivot moment um, has really got me in touch with thinking about how to deal with situations, um, separating the situation from my value as a person. Like as a, as a, as a person, not just as a creator, but like as a person, sometimes those situations can make you feel like they're returning to that not enough kind of thing. And I've, I've been able to develop some um, just ways to think through that and move beyond it to, again, activate on those values. So I think that is all the, 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 uh, the Q and a, um, Oh, wait, I'm, I'm hitting the wrong computer. Alex, is there anything else? Um, I just want to say, for one, before we, yeah, we've got like a few, a, a few folks over here. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just pointing. I don't know why I'm, I'm like pointing at people like in the thing. It's fine. Oh, wait. Oh, wait, you got more. Okay, wait. wait, wait, wait. Oh, here we go. Uh, do you have difficulty finishing a painting and end up painting several paintings under the finished final work? Nice. No, no. I, that's the one thing that I've, I've, um, I am not a perfectionist. Um, even in the, cause you can see like, even I'm, I'm like testing, testing colors out on the wall. Like I want to paint so that I can do the next one. Cause I'll like come across a, a mark or a, a way of doing things or a color combination or something that I'm like, Oh, that's cool. You know, but I want to move on. I want to, I want to finish this and move on to the next story, move on to the next painting. So I actually kind of don't necessarily fall in love with, um, with pieces like that. Like I want them to go out and, uh, and get into the world. Um, although I will take, um, like old canvases that I, I painted something on a couple of years ago and I never did anything with. And I will definitely, I'll definitely paint over that. I do not have uh, romance on, you know, that sort of romantic view of the work that I've, I've, I've created to, uh, you know, to, uh, to stress out over it. Um, so, okay. I think that was, was that all the things hang around everyone? We've got uh, Tanika that is, uh, is going to finish out. I just want to say, um, again, thank you to everybody, to the Maker City. Thank you for everybody that's like here and playing a part. Thank you to Tanika 
who I'm pointing to. She's there. We go. We got this. <laughs> but you guys have done such a good job in such challenging times to put on um, to put on this event that still speaks to people, right? That still speaks to people so strongly. Um, so I just want to say thanks to everybody again. Just uh, Chris McAdoo on this search or chrismacadoo.com. I'd love to, to hear from you. And if I didn't answer your questions again, please feel free to follow up. Again, thank you, Chris. That was um, amazing. So it was great for me to hear. Um, I have been going through this devotion this week called Trust, Hustle, Rest. And it was about the tension between hustling, working, resting, and finding your peace and all of that. So I guess it was a that has been a word for me this season in my life. So thank you so much for, for your um, presentation. So everybody, I hope that you have enjoyed the day. We have really, really appreciated your attendance at today's workshop. Thank you for hanging in there with us. This has been amazing and I've enjoyed all the conversation and enthusiasm, especially in the chat. Um, I think somebody said Alex was the meme master. So I'm, I'm going to come with my meme game on tomorrow. Um, so at this point, we're going to uh, break into discussion groups to just kind of finish out the day. Our scheduled programming has concluded and you are welcome to mix and mingle for another 30 minutes or so. So for tomorrow, we'll be back. Um, lunch pool will open up at 930 and we'll begin our programming at 945 a.m. tomorrow morning. Have a wonderful afternoon and thank you so much for tuning in. Have a great day.